The yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. To New York, to New York. With the yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. Yo, it's in New York. To New York, to New York. And welcome to Crash Chords Autographs. This week, Matt had the honor of chatting with the Juneau, Alaska-based singer-songwriter Marion Cole. Interested in a scope of nerdy ventures, her nerdcore projects extend to collaborating with MC Frontalot on his newest record, Question Bedtime, with her appearance in the song Mornings Come and Go. Upon the release of her own newest record, Marion Cole Sings the Classics Volume 1, Marion set out on her autumn tour from Portland to Portland of which she'll find herself in the New York area on October 19th at 6 p.m. playing at Rockwood Music Hall. Today, Matt speaks with her about the process of making a new record, as well as the expected nerdy digressions, including comic books and Doctor Who. That said, here's presenting Matt Storm and Marion Call. Hi, Marion. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing fine. I appreciate you taking the time to do this interview with me for my podcast. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um... Do you need to do anything to get it recording, or are you already doing it, or what's up? We are already recording. Oh, fantastic. How are you? Good. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, the first thing that's on my mind is, you know, I've been listening to your stuff since I discovered you when you were on tour with um, with uh, Wootstock, um, mm-hmm. and uh, I was recently reminded of your your recent work when you when I uh, purchased MC Furnalot's new record, which you do. Um, a, a, a cor- course is on for um, mornings come and go. And I was curious how that that collaboration came to be with you in front of a lot. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. I'm not... When did I first meet Damien? Um, you know, I'm not even sure. We just, we run in the same social circle or some of the same social circles, obviously. Um, and we have frequently been found at um, sort of events and parties together, even when neither of us is performing as a result. Um, he is one of the nicest people on the planet. He's just one of the kindest people I've ever met, not to mention ridiculously talented. I think okay. the time I'm really connected was probably on the Jonathan Colton cruise. Okay. And we had a little bit more time to hang out and have some fun there. So, and uh, not too long, at, well, let's see, maybe about a year after that, um, he invited me to collaborate on the song. And I thought that was great. And I'm really excited it's finally come out. So yeah. I was I was thrilled. I just recorded my part uh, at home. He gave me a rough idea, and I did everything I could think of. And he used a lot of it, and it was it was great fun. So. Very cool. And so he had the concept for the song already, and then you just added the choruses? Yeah, he had written the the sort of the framework of the chorus already. He'd written the lyrics and the you know the duration and had an idea of the rhythm. Um, and I sort of, uh, I changed the melody and made the harmonies. So. Very cool. Yeah, it's one of my favorite songs on the record. I just really enjoy um, him rapping the, you know, the verses, and then you sing the choruses. The back and forth works very well. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I just finished filming for um, a video collaboration that he was kind of to invite me to do. I hope you use some of that, but we'll see. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, I love that record. I have not been. I mean, I've been getting it stuck in my head <laughs> all yeah. the time. Different songs from that record. It's a great project. Well, I think it's also really cool that he took, you know, bedtime stories and twisted them a bit. You know, I like when artists do that, take something that kind of, you know, you think you know already and then adding a twist to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Much chubbier is really, it's it's so funny and, and really fun and very, um, I love how dark it is. I guess many fairy tales are dark, but he really, um, he picks some good ones and really brings that out. I remember vaguely reading a lot of these when I was a kid you know, in, in sort of old books where you would find fairy tales you'd never heard before. And and uh, I remember just thinking, well, that didn't end like other fairy tales. It's a great concept album. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, especially with like Billy, it took a few times of hearing much chubbier to go, like, I know this. Why is this familiar? Why oh, I get it now. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, I've also... That was great. I've also been uh, checking out your um, 
Marion Kalsing's The Classics, Volume 1, which I know is a, uh, the result of a stress starter. Um, mm-hmm. And my question about that album is, how did you pick the actual songs? So I know the, the each stretch goal was for you to record those songs, but what did you choose those songs for the stretch goals in the first place? Is it just stuff that you like that you've always wanted to record? Um, stuff I, stuff I like, I've always wanted to record. It's sort of my personal collection of, you know, most important songs that shaped me mostly and things I just think it would be really fun to do. I've, uh, done cover songs as fundraisers before, but what I find happens is usually people pick a song that's really, really significant to them. And I'm, I'm happy to do that, of course, but then that song really doesn't have any significance to me. You know, it doesn't quite mean the same thing to me. And I thought, well, this time I'm going to choose the songs. And it will be songs that I know other people would love. I mean, there's no question that people are really fond of a lot of these songs. But they're also probably not, like, people might not know, uh, you know, songs that have significance to me personally because I grew up with them. And uh, it's easier and more fun to cover songs that you have a history with. So uh, so previously I did, like, you know, just pick a, pick a cover, any cover, and tell me what to do. I was totally surprised by the results. It was fun, but I didn't know any of the songs people asked me to do. Um, so this was kind of my answer to that was, well, now I'm going to cover the songs that mean a lot to me and, uh, and see what we can do with them. So it's been a lot of fun. Uh, Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, helps me rewrite some of the science for, um, the Animaniacs song. That was a lot of fun. Yakko's Universe, which like I grew up listening, watching <laughs> the Animaniacs. So when I, when I, oh, yeah. when I first purchased that album and, and saw that you had done Yakko's Universe, I was so excited because I love that song. <laughs> I loved Animaniacs. They were so Animaniacs and Tiny Tunes and Disney Afternoon, you know, those were my cartoons growing up. And uh, Animaniacs was just so, I didn't realize it was so short. It, in my imagination, it ran forever, but apparently it was only two seasons. Yeah, I, I hadn't realized that either. Like, it's you can catch it in reruns now, but there aren't that many episodes. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's just all the more amazing. But, um, yeah, I, the Animaniacs is just some of the most brilliant TV Ever so, and you know, and there's there's other brilliant TV out there that I just didn't happen to see. So it would be weird to record something from that, even if ever it would be weird to record like you know uh, the Transformers or theme song or some other you know uh, <laughs> a song associated with something that I didn't uh, know or love. So that was the fun. Was I? Everyone always begs me to do cover songs, but they always want me to do their cover song that they have in mind. So I thought, well, let's let's put some parameters on this, and it'll be a fun way to. Uh, raise some money and um, and do a new project. So I don't release very many covers. I don't perform very many because of uh, kind of licensing and stuff. So sure. So this is my chance. This is my chance. <laughs> well, I think it's a great success. Personally, I very much enjoy the record. I like the songs that you chose, like the Reading Rainbow theme. Also, it's like any kid, <laughs> you know, any adult over a certain age remembers that theme and remembers watching that show. You know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, LeVar Burton was, you know, I think he's one of the only celebrity famous people that, where I've, that I've met where I've had the total, like, you know, fall over faint, ridiculous reaction. And I think it's just because he's one of the first people that I remember recognizing as a famous person as a kid, <laughs> you know. He's one yeah. of the first people in my mind who is who is a famous person from such an early age that, like, to realize he's a real human now is just, like, crazy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, it was all the more touching. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, I'm sure you saw the campaign he did to bring Reading Rainbow back. Um, oh, and, absolutely. And then the reaction video once they broke a million dollars and like his, him, his tears of joy, like was so touching. I was like, this is why I contributed to this campaign because <laughs> this man cares about reading, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And he's such a, he's such a great guy. He's, yeah. So, um, you know, that's been fun. I'm excited to do the second half of the project. I, it's, um, it's like slow and expensive to do these things, but I'm really excited to finish that. Cool. Do you have a, a release date for volume two? Nope. I don't, I, I really don't know. I have to, I have to fundraise to be able to uh, record the rest of the songs basically. So, gotcha. Okay. Um, and so it kind of just depends when I'm able to, you know, go, okay, so I have two or three, thousand extra dollars now. Let's do that. So, um, and I mean, hopefully, uh, hopefully I will wind up that way after this next tour, you know, barring, barring car repairs or anything like that. But that's very much the sort of indie life is very hand in mouth. So if nothing goes wrong and I don't have any crazy 
weird, expensive trip detours then. Um, <laughs> I should wind up with enough money to take care of it this winter, uh, like in December. So. Very, very cool. So they don't know, which is why I've learned better than to announce release dates. <laughs> right. Keep, keep everybody yep. in the dark until you have it. And then they're just excited that it's here. Yeah, when I was when I was a little bit newer at this, I would announce dates all the time, and then I'd always be so frustrated by blowing by the deadlines or whatever. And I didn't know yet that that's just. I mean, that's when you live hand to mouth. That's what you have to do is just go. Well, sometimes something comes up, and then you can't do that. And sometimes something doesn't come up, and you get it all done in time. But usually something comes up. So uh, now just letting the material um, happen when it happens. Like I was actually just able to finish this because. A friend of mine let me into their studio for two days uh, and for free. And I was like, oh, my God, I can do it. Yes. It was such a stroke of luck. And I recorded for like 16 hours straight to get it done. So um, it was awesome. I was really excited. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, I, well, I'd imagine, though, uh, recording for 16 hours straight is a little intense. I'm hoping you stop to at least eat at some point during that. Um, I, had, I brought a bunch of granola bars and had some tea and coffee, and uh, and I remember going out for pizza at night. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, another thing I wanted to ask was um, – which I can't remember if, if I've read before where, uh, or not, but, um, I know that you use a typewriter a lot in your songs. Um, it was actually one of my favorite things about seeing you live when I first did, um, playing the typewriter live as an instrument, which I'd never seen before. Where did you discover that you could use it as a percussion instrument? Was that something you learned from someone else or you just kind of stumbled upon? Um, anything that makes noise is an instrument. That's always been my belief and my family's belief. I was raised by musicians and uh, and lots of lots of composers and songwriters and arrangers throughout history have just used that kind of noise as part of music, you know. And so that was not weird to me at all. Um, I wanted to use a typewriter for a very specific song to sort of evoke a very specific, nerdy, antiquated, reserved, secretarial, librarian sort of mood, you know, and that was for Vanilla on my right. first album. Um, I really wanted people to get put into the headspace that a typewriter puts you into, you know, because it's a sound that it's not just like a percussion sound. It's not just like a drum or something. It really puts you in a mood of a specific kind. And that's what I wanted. So I used that. And then I thought that was it. I recorded it in the studio and I was done. And then my friends at the shows in, you know, my first few shows up in Alaska were saying, well, where's your typewriter? And I was like, why would I have a typewriter? That's weird. Um, <laughs> and then I thought, well, of course I should get a typewriter. I've always wanted a typewriter, you know, and so I bought one, and then it became my best friend, and then I bought another one, and then I bought five, and yeah, I have a lot of typewriters now, and I keep looking at them online, and I need to stop. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're so wonderful. Um, we, you're not the only uh, typewriter collector out there, actually. I've heard from uh, good sources that Tom Hanks actually collects typewriters. Yeah, uh, lots of people do these days. They're getting very, they're getting kind of vogue. So I just <laughs> say I was into typewriters before they got cool again. Well, of course. Um, yeah, I'm a typewriter history. No, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I don't think they were ever really, really out of fashion, but they are, um, uh, I don't know. I think they're a nice, they're a nice complement to our digital lives to go do something analog where you, you hit a physical key and a physical gear moves a physical lever up to stamp out a letter on a page without any electricity. Like there's something really sort of elegant and refreshing about that. And I've started using it to write letters to people and things. And um, uh, like my grandpa is not an email age person. If I write him email, he won't answer. But if I write him a typewriter letter, then he sends me a typewritten letter back. And, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's really wonderful. So, and if you send something like I've, dashing off emails at the rate of, you know, dozens or hundreds a day. And if you stop and send someone a typewritten or a handwritten letter, suddenly that's a, you know, it's a treasure. It's like an heirloom. <laughs> Which is funny that it's come that way, considering it was one of the most common things decades ago. Oh, yeah. Well, it didn't used to be like that. It didn't used to be particularly sentimental. Um, but now, now it means, you know, a little extra, I guess. I guess so. Um uh -huh. 
So I know you're, you live in Alaska. Um, are, have you always, did you grow up in Alaska or um, did you move there within the recently? No, I moved here in 2003. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's been 11 years now. I lived in Anchorage for a long time. Now I live in Juneau. And uh, uh, I didn't expect to stay this long, but here I am. So. Cool. Um, where are you originally from? Oh, I grew up in Puget Sound, about an hour outside of Seattle. And then I went to school in California, so I lived there. Cool. So you've been all over the country. Well, I'm mostly all over the West Coast. I didn't really oh, start traveling at all until uh, I started doing music. And I know you've gone across the country on tour before, because the first time I had seen you, it was in New York. Um, do you, That's right. I, I, well, I was on a 50 States tour that year when I did uh, the Wootstocks. Yes. Yeah. I remember because uh-huh. I had um, you had gone online and said if people sent you addresses, you would send out postcards. And so you would send out postcards <laughs> of places from other places, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> that was an amazing project. I think I only got it about half done. That's a great regret of mine that I couldn't finish it. Maybe someday I will. I still have some. I wrote about 150 postcards, but I forgot to buy cap the number I was going to send out. So I got about 300 requests. Oh wow! And after after like a year, I just had to kind of set it aside so I could do other things. But um, uh, I still have the box here. Uh, they would only need more postage, <laughs> but maybe I'll finish it someday just to surprise people. And whoever happens to still be at that address will get a big surprise. Right. Imagine someone who's at that address who wasn't the original person who gave the address gets a postcard. Like, who is Marion Call? A postcard from a random person, yeah. I'll do a little Googling and find out, I guess. <laughs> so uh, when you're not writing music or, or working on music-related things, do you have particular uh, pastime nerdy or not nerdy that you like to indulge in? Um, mostly to sort of soothe the stress, I guess. I'd say more escapism now than uh than just hobby hobbyist stuff i guess um well i guess the main thing that i do is i read um an awful lot of uh articles on twitter and on um and and facebook and just you know where you find them uh i just i i guess i read a lot about what's happening in in quote nerd culture gamer culture politics um i just try and kind of read everything i can uh, tons of web comics, tons of, um, I, I don't know, just thinking people's content, I guess. I spend most of my time doing that. Uh, um, I was a voracious reader. Now I have a harder time settling into books just because I tend to only have little snippets of time. Um, but I still am. I'm reading Cryptonomicon right now and um, waiting eagerly for Patrick Rothfuss and George R. R. Martin to get their acts together. <laughs> and guys, on your own time, on your own time. Uh, and uh, I play some video games, not many. I don't let myself actually have very many video games because I am the kind of person who can binge for weeks, you know, on a, on a video game. Not even a very good one. I just I have <laughs> capacity. And um, I love the Zelda games. Uh, I'm embarrassed to admit how many hours I spent on Diablo 3. I <laughs> Time. Um, I'm actually currently playing Diablo 2 because I didn't have the experience of doing that in college, kind of when everyone else did. Like my brother and everyone else I knew was playing Diablo 2 for like a year, and I uh, never did because I was too busy studying, and now I'm going back and doing it. It's super fun. Um, what do you think of Diablo 2 now that you've played Diablo 3 first? Oh, the, the story, frankly. I, yeah. <laughs> Diablo 3 was not, I did not spend a lot of time on it because it was a particularly good game. I just spent a lot of time on it because I am capable of doing that. And that's why I'm not allowed to have games on my own computer or my own phone or my own iPad. Um, (laughs) Because you don't trust yourself to put it down. Oh, yeah. It's it's a self-limitation thing. I mean, I got got the new Legend of Zelda. That was, you know, a special treat to get Link Between Worlds for 3DS. And I've definitely played it through four times by now. I love that game. I think it's funny. It I, so good. <laughs> I got myself in a lot of trouble because I, I have a lot of access to social media and I went online and went and flat out said that that's the best Zelda game they've ever made. And all of my friends were like, what are you talking about? But I mean, for oh. me, my favorite is Link to the Past. And this is pretty much a spiritual successor to that, especially in gameplay and style yeah. and song. So like for me, this is hands down it one of the best great. games I've ever made. 
Mm-hmm. Although I also just replayed the 3D revisualization of uh, Ocarina, and it didn't feel so great. It didn't feel so great. Yeah, that's another one of my problems. On, I can't handle what 3D makes me sick. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm the same way. The problem with the 3DS is unless you're looking directly at it and, like, holding it straight at arm's length, the images blur, and then it gives me a headache. So oh, I yeah, usually I keep the 3DS. Off, but <laughs> yeah. But, um, oh, I'm not going to read comics, I guess. I, my, my partner owns a comic book store, and I'm kind of part of a little art collective here. And we sell our work. Uh, we have a, it's like a combination comic book store art gallery and oh, cool. also a lot of local art, including my CDs, and then it also is a local comic book store, because it's a very small town, so. Uh, so let's see, I'm getting some interference on this side. Is that coming through on your recording? Um, I, you sound pre- you sound okay to me. I mean, I don't hear you breaking up at all, so. Okay, good. I'm just getting a little bit of an echo here. I wanted to make sure it wasn't on your tape, but, um, yeah, so I read I read uh, comic books when I get a chance. I've been, I led Sandman Book Club a while back. That was fun, just on an old-fashioned forum with no ads and no anything. It was really, really great. It was really nice to be in a space where everyone was just talking and there was no there was no monetization strategy. I don't know. It was fun to be on a forum again. And, yeah, I loved it. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, I tend, I'm not very much for capes and cowls. I'm just trying to tackle some X-Men, but there's just so much. So, yeah, I often find I myself really, in, intimidated by Marvel and DC these days because there's just so much of it. There's so much, and a lot of what they're writing now is like a competition in, in darkness and stuff, and I don't know, like, I don't really necessarily dig that. Like, I, So I've got some, like, Matt Fraction, Brian K. Vaughn, Fables. Uh, I'm reading The Unwritten right now, which is fantastic. A friend of mine was obsessed with that. He said it was fantastic. It's so great. Oh, my God, it's so great. I, I'm excited to very and like, waiting to read the next one. And uh, I also like some uh, graphic novels by people who do, you know, just single, complete graphic novels, like, uh, like Sigur Brosko and some other, and... Uh, Kazu Kirishi and you know there's some just some great stuff out there I love the Nelly Verse book um, yeah can't wait to get the new what if so it's you know not kids and cows I don't you know I don't have a comprehensive comics knowledge but I really love them and it's fun to kind of discover them a little bit later on because I think growing up I got I, I don't know where I absorbed it but I definitely got the girls don't read comic books message uh Probably just from the only comics people I knew as a kid who were all like ten year old boys. That's probably not why you want to get your social messaging. Yeah. But, uh, but then I got older and found out no one was going to keep me from reading them, and then I found out I love them, and so I'm catching up slowly. Very cool. Yeah, I tried keeping up with comic books for a while, but most of the trade, like I was buying them in trades, because I couldn't even buy them weekly, and then after a while I couldn't even keep up with that. Oh, so. it's so expensive. Yeah. So like expensive. That. Thankfully, our library has some, and also, thankfully, sometimes I work at the store, uh, which means I can read them in the store. <laughs> nice. That's great. <laughs> yes. Employee privileges. Um, <laughs> well, that's like I, I yeah. used to work for GameStop years ago, and I played way more video games then than I do now. A, because I don't have as much time, but B, because like you could borrow out games like a free blockbuster when you worked for GameStop. So I just bring home yeah. games that I was only even moderately interested in just to try them, you know? Oh, yeah. So employee pr- yeah. privileges have their place in retail, even if retail jobs aren't <laughs> always the best. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess, um, and I guess music's the other thing I do recreationally. I'm a, I'm a DJ on our local radio station here. I'm a big NPR junkie. Oh, cool. And, uh, and so I play music and try, and try and remember to force myself each week to find some more music to play. <laughs> Very cool. Um <laughs> Are you planning on uh, leaving Alaska for another tour anytime soon? Do you have any tours in the works? Yeah, I'm going to do a big cross-country tour. It's called the, uh, where are you again? You're East Coast, right? Yeah, New York. Yeah, New York. Okay, yes, I'll be in New York soon. Um, cool. I'm doing a bit, east, uh, like, sort of across the north. I'm calling it the Portland to Portland tour. It's from Portland, Oregon to uh, Portland, Maine. Oh, very and, cool. Um, yeah, and back again. So it's going to be a massive tour. I'm I'm actually getting the... Announcements and everything kind of ready now, and it, there's a lot of house concerts, but I really prefer house concerts, and almost anyone who's been brave enough to come to a house concert 
um, has, I think, been rewarded by, uh, uh, I don't know, they're just really special experiences. So sometimes it takes some convincing to get people there, but they are the best. Very cool. Yeah, I have a few friends who play locally uh, and play house concerts. Oh, cool. Good. Yeah, the house concert in New York is going to be right on Lake Union Square. It's going to be awesome. Oh, excellent. I'll just have to look into that and check it out. Yeah, we're going to do a Sunday afternoon, actually, because people tend to have so much trouble just, like, moving around New York. <laughs> you know, travel time is such a consideration there. Yes, that is for sure. As someone who commutes into the city from Brooklyn every day, it's it can uh-huh. be trying. Um, yep. If you're if you have any downtime when you're in New York, I would recommend stopping by the Waystation if you've not heard of it. Um, it's a bar in my neighborhood that's a, a steampunk bar with its own Doctor Who TARDIS in it. It's just a really fun place for nerds to go and. Oh yeah, I've actually I've played there before. Yeah. Oh cool. I, that's the neighborhood I used to stay when I uh, came to New York. And uh, I, yeah, I used to be like two blocks from there whenever I came to town. And this is actually it's a new house concert it's with the same friend, but she's in Manhattan. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's always the first place I recommend any nerd to go to because a my, mm-hmm. my one of my good friends owns it, so you know I like to help oh, awesome. him up. But also it's because you know I it's one of the first bars oh, I've awesome. ever really felt comfortable in. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I like it a lot. That's cool. Great. I was just watching some Doctor Who as I was working just now. I'm I'm slow to get to it, but I'm, you know, catching up. Are you in the current season or are you still behind? No, I'm kind of jumping around. Like, I watched a bunch of Matt Smith stuff. I started with uh, started with the first Matt Smith episode like, and um, watched some of that, and then I decided to go back and start with the Night Stalker. Um, uh, he's my favorite. It's so reboot. And, um, and sort of get caught up on kind of the uh, you know, there's like, there's some episodes that are just episodes and there's like touchstone episodes that, you know, everyone refers to all the time. Yeah. So I'm kind of catching up on that. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Yeah. The Ninth Doctor, uh, Christopher Eccleston was my favorite and still my favorite. Oh yeah? Yeah. I just, oh, I like something about an angry doctor who, you know, is just full of rage and as ex- is as equally excited as he is angry, which I mm. see a little bit of the new doctor that they cast Peter Capaldi. So I'm excited about that too. Yeah, I'm definitely curious about Capaldi. I like I I always get happy whenever I see anyone on any TV show who's not like, you know, between 20 and 40 and super handsome, you know, or super pretty. I'm just like, okay, this person can be interesting. Yes, yeah, I like when they, they cast people. Bit, oh, it might be a little bit prejudiced of me against you know like medium aged pretty people, but honestly, <laughs> I feel like I have to kind of get past that to enjoy their acting. No, I think it's a fair judgment. I feel like that's, you know, especially for TV. I mean, as someone who's only going to be 31 this year, but, you know, I see a lot of people around my age on TV, but they're like super handsome and slick back and clean cut. And it's like, eh, nobody, people are not that perfect in life. Like everyone has flaws of some kind, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and I just don't like the sort of bias to people of that age. I'm like, come on, a lot of older people are smarter than, you know. And, it's, and you want to make something interesting, throw a kid or an old person into the plot. And suddenly it gets more interesting than just having all these, like, this self-selecting group of, you know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> no, I think it's a, a va- valid claim about modern TV. Right. I do think, I, so far, I think Tenet is my favorite, though, actually. Um, yeah, I like Tenet. Yeah, it um, doesn't surprise me too much. A lot of my friends are on the tenant boat. I liked tenant, but I don't know. There was, I got, I started with with Christopher Eccleston, so I think that's why I like him so much. Also, oh, I'd yeah, start, yeah, yeah. I'd gone back and binge watched the re, you know the reboot up until like halfway through tenant season, and then I was caught up. So, but yeah. uh, but yeah. I I like tenant towards the end of his run when he starts to unravel a bit and more of the character. It's very cool to see how he changes. You know. Yeah. Well, I think I it might even be more than ten, and I'm enjoying some of the writing of some of the episodes. Yeah. You know, like seeing seeing some of the episodes that everyone talks about for the first time. That's kind of fun. Like I wouldn't say I'm a, I, I wouldn't say I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm a fan per se. I don't feel that involved, but I do want to know. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that's really really brilliant writing, and um, that is starting to happen more. And I, I've noticed since I watched the Matt Smith stuff that it starts to diminish as the Stephen Moffat thing becomes more pronounced. So. Uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying this kind of being in the middle space here. 
Yeah. yeah, a lot of people have had complaints about Moffat's writing, although it's seeming to be a lot less of a problem in the new season. I've enjoyed the new season episodes more than some of the tail end Matt Smith stuff, but but okay. it does seem to become a pro- problem, whereas Russell T. Davies seemed to be a much tighter run, uh, writer most of the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. I I do find it, I mean, see, this is the other thing I do in my spare time is talk with nerds about things and uh, you know, and discuss all this stuff. <laughs> So, yep. Cool. Um, do you have besides the um, the two uh, albums of the uh, you singing covers? Do you have new music in the work that's of original stuff as well? Oh yeah, I mean, Sketchbook is still, I guess, relatively new um, mm-hmm. as far as albums go. Like it's ancient history in the internet world, but it's still quite new for me. Um, so I'm still touring some of the sketchbook stuff and I'm making plans for my next big studio album and big studio albums really mean big fundraising projects, but, um, at least that's what comes first and, uh, um, right. prepping for that and, um, uh, it's going to probably, we'll probably record it in April, but it's probably not going to be out until late next year. So it's, I mean, it's a slow timeline when you do everything yourself. Right, I imagine. Uh, it's, I think you, for what, me, that's right around the corner, you know, like it's coming right up. Uh, oh, I guess I'm planning a holiday EP this year. That's right. It'll be short, but it will have some new original stuff on it as well. So oh, very cool. That's the plan. I'm going to try and record it in Seattle uh, in about two weeks. And it's a live recording, so people are invited to come if they're in Seattle. Um, and uh, going to hopefully make a, good, uh, make a good concert out of it. That's awesome. Yeah. And for since we have listeners who are New York locals, do you have a date for the New York show that you know offhand, the New York House concert? Um, yes, it's going to be Sunday, October 19th, and it's going to be an afternoon show, trying to make it easy for people to get to and from and still have enough energy, you know. Um, yeah, and I'll be in central Manhattan. I also have two uh, New Jersey shows because I know that those can actually be easier for some folks to reach. Oh, very cool. What areas of New Jersey? Uh, there's going to be one in Princeton and one in Bridgewater. Oh, awesome. Uh, both both very easy to reach from, you know, by train or by transit. So, one's the House Concert and one's at the Arts Council of Princeton for, uh, I'll be with uh, Sarah Donner's big CD release party. Sarah Donner's awesome. Have you talked to her? No, I haven't actually. I've, I've heard of her. Um, a friend of mine. Oh, is she's very, great. I'll have to. Uh... You're a very good um, rebuttal of uh, Schrodinger's cat talks back, basically. Oh, Perfect. Awesome. To Schrodinger to to explain a thing or two from cat perspective. Very good. That's very um, cool. I'll yeah, definitely have to check that out. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the I guess the the, the last thing I want to ask because I, I know that I don't want to keep you too long, but um, is besides writing music and and recording music. Um, on your own, do you have any aspirations to try new things outside of the kind of folk genre that you write in? Try some some new stuff, or maybe join up with a band, or just kind of prefer to stick solo and do your own thing. Um, no, absolutely. I'd love to, like I I I love to collaborate. The challenge is always money. Um, like I can I when I record, I record with a band and with lots and lots of instruments and it's fun. I think this next album is gonna be a lot more like I can't describe it as folk. It's gonna be like pop and rock and oh, awesome. stuff, you know? And um and like I love to work with jazz combos, I love to play with rock bands, but you can't tour with them and you can only mount shows with them maybe once or twice a year because there's just not enough money to go around when you split it five ways, you know? Sure. And uh, when you spend a week on rehearsal, like you have to. So so it's mostly, it's a, it's a matter of funding to actually take that kind of show on the road. I very much want to do it. And since I'm recording my next album in Texas, it's likely that like Austin, Dallas, and Houston might get some band shows, you know, since we'll all be there and be rehearsing. Um, but, uh, but generally, uh, I have a hard time putting together band shows on the road. So, but maybe we'll get a chance to do some good, like, video content or some live streaming or uh, stuff like that with a band, because I wish. I mean, I've got, <laughs> I have I have a lot more than just acoustic stuff sort of in, in my in my heart and in my soul, if I may be cliche. And if you've heard <laughs> uh, Scott Barkin, one of the guitarists who plays with me a lot, he is yeah. incredibly funky. Like, as far as acoustic guitars go, he's like a whole band himself. He is the drums and the bass too as much as you can possibly be on guitar he's incredible um 
So, yeah, I wish there was more. And I would love to do some electronic stuff and some looping. I just really, really don't know how. Like, I do not, I cannot make beats. But, it went, like, getting to do this with Brown Lot was really fun. I wish, uh, I would love a chance to collaborate with someone who does that and record some interesting songs of the kind that I feel like should really be electronic stuff, you know, a little bit more like, um, you know, Broken Social Scene or something like that, or churches. That'd be great. But um, just depends on meeting the right people, having the right time, the right amount of time, and sort of being able to stop uh, my own everyday business long enough to do it because that uh, it, it's always money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> when, you're a, when you're a DIY creator, you kind of have to, you're... Uh, you're weirdly simultaneously obligated to try something new and exciting to get everyone's attention and to stay relevant. And simultaneously, you really have to keep doing what you're doing or else you run out of money and the floor falls out from under you. So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a scramble, but I don't think that there's ever been a point in time where being a musician or an independent artist has ever not been a scramble. Right. I mean, you know, it's a scramble now. It was also a scramble back when the labels were in charge, and it was also a scramble before that. It was also a scramble when you were a medieval, you know, troubadour roaming from town to town. It's it's just always been a scramble. So, uh, but I hope for enough of a break in that scramble to try lots of new stuff. I mean, and I want to, you know, take a break and write a screenplay or write a musical or write a book and all that stuff. But. I always got to figure out the money first. <laughs> yes. It seems like the, the the we're always going to be in a place where the money's kind of got to come first. Well, and I think it's a little bit more the older you get too. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not 25 anymore. I can't just run around and sleep in my car. I got to think about things like uh, like debt and health insurance and where I'm going to live for the next few years and how uh, inefficient to destroy my body into the ground and stuff like that. So it, then the, you get a little bit older and you think, okay, I got to start fixing my financial house because not having that in order as you get older can be a kind of, it can be a big creative inhibitor, you know, having a ton of money is not necessary, but being out of any kind of financial enslavement gives you a lot more creative freedom and a lot more freedom to help other people and collaborate with other people and support good causes. So, sure. yeah. Very cool. Figuring that out, getting out of the, getting out of the financial slavery zone into the, making it scraping by zone, um, which I think is insight with a lot more hard work, you know? Yeah, for sure. A lot of hard work, little luck, uh, a lot of support from a lot of good people. So, totally. Yeah. And there's that, I mean, the people I've met on the way who have been supportive, even just the people who come out to concerts, they're amazing. That's why I really love touring this way. You just meet such incredible people coast to coast, across the ocean, on the internet, everywhere. Well, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, well, the the thing about you when I first saw you perform live is I hadn't really known anything about you. You put on such a great show, and then I got to meet you afterwards, and you were just so wonderful and sweet. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to go home and go on her site and buy all of her music and listen to everything. So. Oh, geez. Well, that's a nice side effect. So. I. That's a nice side effect, but even if even if you didn't, like, I'd rather have the life where I get to do this and travel around and meet amazing people and be wonderful and sweet anyway, and so <laughs> it's, like, I don't know. It's a privilege. It really is a privilege uh, to get to to get to personally connect to, oh, uh, geez, all these words sound like buzzwords. I don't like it when they come out of my mouth sometimes. <laughs> like, even connect is not allowed to be a buzzword. Community is not allowed to be a buzzword. Those words mean things. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to, you know, find a way to defend those those meanings, the authenticity there, without them getting all sucked dry by, I don't know, corporate money speak. How can we monetize our connections in the social blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I just, I mean, um, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, I feel uh, very honored that people allow me to do this because I don't. I don't do it on my own steam, even though I work very hard. I do it because of the grace of literally thousands of people who, you know, keep listening. Cool. Um, in in wrapping up, I, I did want to ask if you had, and this is kind of a cheesy buzzwordy question, but I always like to know uh, uh, musicians' insights. So uh, you can shame me if you hate the question, but I always just like to ask, like, if you had advice for other artists 
you know, musicians, actors, singers, writers, you know, people who are running on their own steam, what would be your best advice to them? Oh, yeah, God, I'd love to share that. Like, I talk about that all day. <laughs> I could figure out a way to help, you know, to, to if I get to ever retire, that's going to be my business is trying to figure out how to help other people deal with the scramble. Um, uh, I would say the most important thing that I've learned is don't fish where everyone else is fishing. Um and uh, that applies in a lot of ways. But the thing, the thing I take from it mostly is to look at what everyone else is doing. I try to be really aware of what other people in my field are doing. I read a lot of music blogs. I read a lot of music news. Um, I follow a lot of other similar artists to me. And I watch what they're doing carefully. Um, and then I steal what works. But I try very hard not to copy, you know, especially not to copy any one strategy. Like, I have to look at each tool that they're using and say, this was a great tool for them. Does it make sense for me? This is a great strategy for them. Does it make sense for me? Because a, the, a lot of the failures and falling down on your noses that I see from people is when they're trying to copy someone else, but in a way that doesn't make sense for them, you know. Right. And so by just being self-aware enough to know which strategies make sense for you and not just blindly copy what the crowd says, what the blog says, what this other artist did, you know, not doing a Kickstarter just because everyone else is doing a Kickstarter, but asking if it's a good tool for you, not doing a, you know, not, uh, not have like for, uh, even some of my own family members, not trying to do Twitter just because everyone else is doing Twitter. If it makes no sense to you, you know, or even sometimes just unplugging and going analog when everyone else is going more and more digital, whatever it is, you know, just do what works for you instead of going with the stream. Be aware of what everyone else is doing, but do what works for you. And and ask yourself honestly if all these tools are useful because probably you don't need a thousand tools. You only need five, but you want the ones that work for you, not the ones that worked for someone else. So I don't know. I think the future of independent creators probably looks like not a single solution, not a single Kickstarter or Patreon or Tumblr community life or whatever. Like, I don't think it looks like any of those things. I think it looks like thousands of people doing completely different things, you know, little variations on supporting themselves. So, and the more different they are, the better for us because any one strategy that everybody floods is going to fail. That's, I guess, yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Thank you so right. much for that. That was wonderful. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. Um, I've been a, a huge fan for a while, and it's always great to get to oh, talk nice. to you. And um, I'm hoping that when you're in New York in October, I can make it to that house show, because it would be great to be able to chat with you in person, too. Oh, it would be wonderful to meet you again. That would be great. It would be a great house show. The y'all hosting it makes great snacks. Um, <laughs> very cool yeah <laughs> yep and you might have seen her at the way station sometimes who knows I probably um, um, uh, very likely she went there a lot um, I oh uh, what was I going to say <laughs> oh, yeah, link, link me when it's done you know send me a link so I can share Oh, yes, absolutely. So this is a biweekly show, and I have uh, one or two other episodes in the queue to come out. So it'll probably come out closer to the end of the month. Um, but as soon as, as soon as it goes up on the website, I'll send you the link so you can share it around, and I appreciate that. Um, it's It's been a pleasure doing this kind of a thing. You know, back in the analog days when I first made my website, it was all phone interviews transcribed into written interviews. And now with the wonders of technology, I can just record the phone conversation and release it on iTunes as a podcast. And it's been great. I've done, <laughs> I've done three other episodes have gone out. I have two more to come out. And then I have my main podcast, which is uh, th me and two other co-hosts doing an album review show every week where we have guests once a month. So, oh, wow. Sweet. so if you ever find yourself in New York for an extended period of time, I'd love to have you review music with us. I think that'd be a blast. Yeah, that'd be fun. No problem. That'd be great. Um, cool. And feel free to ping me again anytime for stuff. You know, if you see me doing something and you want to do another interview or if you want to, you know, ask for contact info for someone you think I know or whatever, just let me know. Great. Thank you so much, Marion. This has been a pleasure. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Likewise. Have a great night. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. you. I guess. Bye. Night. <laughs> Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed these interviews, please subscribe to this and the Crash Chords podcast on iTunes, where you can also rate us and review us. 
You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Crash Chords Web, our Tumblr, and our YouTube channel. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post in the comment area below each post. And keep the discussion going, because remember, music is life, and life is good.